Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. We just had the most extraordinary show the other night. Last one of the year with Kima Bob before she went back to America. And then an incredible live event with Grace Petrie singing and discussing the songs from her new album. It was a riot. So thank you so much to everyone who came out for it. And don't miss the live recording at the Soho Theatre in London, Tuesday, 9th of November. Today's episode co-host is coasting then. It's Catherine Bohart. And we'll be talking to comedian, writer and poet Soph Galustian. It's going to be a Guilty Feminist comedy classic. And there's also not many tickets left for my stand-up show from the 30th of November to the 5th of December. That's right, I'm doing a new hour of stand-up comedy called The Guilty Feminist Stands Up. There are very few tickets left, so please go to SohoTheatre.com and snap some up if you'd like them. I'm really looking forward to being there with you and sharing some stuff that came out of the pandemic for me. I can't wait. Now, I'm going to tell you about our Christmas show. It is not on sale yet. Alert, it is not on sale yet, but please save the date. December the 16th, tickets will go on sale this week. So join our mailing list or our Patreon if you want to be alerted first for tickets. Follow the link in the show notes or on the website. It is going to be a huge queer extravaganza. Tom Allen himself and I are co-hosting it. Comedians include some of your favourites, Jess Foster Q and Jen Brister, and also the Queen herself, Sandy Toxvig. There are some other extraordinary names like Travis Alabanza, Raven Smith, and some names I cannot reveal yet, but you're going to want to be there is all I'm saying. The reason it's a big LGBTQ plus extravaganza is that we are raising money for the Say It Loud Club. Many of you will remember the episode with Aloysius, a refugee from Uganda that started this organisation to support LGBTQ plus refugees running from violent homophobia and criminalisation. The other half of the proceeds will be going to Dr. Rola Hallam, a recent guest. Her organisation, Can Do, is raising money to alarm Syrian schools in a war zone. The night will be spectacular. The holiday event of the year. Do not miss it. There's also going to be an incredible auction. Join me and Tom Allen and our guests. Finally, big speeches with Jess Regan. Online courses to help you find your voice at times to suit all time zones. Go to guiltyfeminist.com slash big speeches or follow the link in the show notes. This is truly a wonderful Guilty Feminist self-development program. And now on with the podcast. I'm a feminist, but recently I agreed to be in a book about adoption for children. And when they asked me, could you sign off your page about your life? I saw that they had an illustration of me that I found too dowdy. So I said <laughs> to the adoption children book people, do you think I could have another illustration? Because I want the little adopted children to realise they can aspire to glamour and sex appeal. And they said, yes, we will ask our illustrator to redraw you only hotter. And do you know what they did? And I am so pleased with it. Now, you may think you're a narcissist, Catherine, but here's the thing. This was my reasoning to myself. I'm not going to promote this book, which is a very worthy book. It's a book that adopted children should have. I'm not going to promote it. If I find the illustration of myself, to, and just to be clear, the illustrator did a great job, a great job, but it was just based on an older photo that I felt held a dowdiness that I wasn't truly comfortable with. Look, Deb, you got to be sexy for them kids. I'm not saying I wanted to be sexy for the kids, <laughs> just to be clear. I just felt that the illustration could have more pizzazz about it and I could look a little less matronly and a little more va va voom. Honestly, now, I was scared about I was scared about my I'm a feminist book because I I'm going to say something that I don't know if the guilty feminist listeners will get on board with, but you've made me feel a lot better. Yeah. I mean, that's a real confession. Sometimes I hold things back because I think people are going to judge me, but then I run out of things because I've got to have so many and I think, ah, fuck it. It's, yeah. This is con feminist confessional. You understand that. You're Catholic. I really do. Which is, brings me to, I'm a feminist, but occasionally I think the only thing that stands between me and true happiness it's just a tiny bit of Botox. <laughs> Where? My forehead. Just, just, and just put, just go like this. 
I mean, I honestly can't see. The, the thing is, if you look up, of course you should have some lines there. Where's the skin going to go? Yes, I know all of the rational arguments against it, Deborah. The I question asked- is, what's the skin like in repose? And yours is absolutely flawless. Thank you, but that's not really what it's about, is it, Deborah? It's that I have work to do on myself, and that seems like the easy option. So do I go to <laughs> therapy or do I spend 15 minutes with a dental nurse? I think I want to do the latter, it seems, quicker. I'm not saying never have Botox, and I'm not saying women who have Botox are wrong or bad. I am saying you do not need Botox. And even it, no, no one needs Botox, but you, even in the capitalist billboard world of, oh, I want to be like that, other women are showing pictures of you to their Botox doctors and saying, I want to look like Catherine Bohart. You're That's, nice. You're I'm going to nice. say, give it a decade and okay. then reassess. If you really want Botox in a decade, I will allow it. I'm okay, not saying what? what anyone should or shouldn't have it, just to be clear. I know people think it's unfeminist and other people say, well, if it's your choice and you want to look more like you used to, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to get into, some people will be disappointed in me because I'm not going to get into it either way. I'm just going to say, I really feel whether or not you have poison popped into your face is your own decision. <laughs> Fine, Deborah. I guess I'll just keep getting my ears pierced when I need to feel something. Jeez. I'm a decisive, empowered feminist, but I don't know my own mind when it comes to wallpaper. I buy these samples all the time off the internet. There are certain walls I would like to zhuzh up. And I don't know if you've ever seen Sarah Pascoe's house or seen her Instagram where she's got all these different beautiful patterns. So patterned wallpaper, then a patterned chair in front of it, and it looks really amazing. And I just feel like I need more textures and layers. And I'm try- I was trying to do my flat a bit on, you know, without spending any money just because in the pandemic there was literally nowhere else to go. And I thought, if I just get some new cushions, there'll be something new to look at. I'll be re-energised and I'll, I'll, I'll want to do some writing and, and, and yeah, feel better see, about myself. Cu- now, cushions, your cushions are my Botox. I get it. Right, exactly. Your cushions <laughs> are my Botox. Might be a Guilty <laughs> Feminist t-shirt. But I thought, oh, wallpaper. That wallpaper's good. I have got blue tacked big sheets of wallpaper that I buy. I buy these samples. You can get them online, like three quid a sheet. And okay. I then live with them for a while. And then I go, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. No, it's too much. It's too much. I'm a woman. I know my own mind. And then it comes to squiggly patterns on the wall and I fall apart like eggy bread. I have a, it's not the same, but for me, winter coats are this because it feels like such a commitment that it's like, what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to decide forever, am I? But the thing about wallpaper is, I think you actually have to be a more easygoing person who's like, oh yeah, I'll just change it if I don't like it. Whereas I'm like, but then I will have made an error for which I should punish myself for years. So I totally understand. Pasco's done this smart thing though, where she didn't choose a wallpaper. She's got all of them. Yeah. And it looks phenomenal. Looks phenomenal. I don't know that I, I have that confidence. I don't have the confidence. I don't have the confidence of Pasco. No, it's absolutely brazen. Because you're committing to that and you're committing to not getting tired of it and to sort of not being a rep. But it's so beautiful what she's done. Yeah. She's a stunning. maximalist. She's not a minimalist. And I, I'm not a minimalist. I think minimalism is boring. Please at me. At me right now. Uh, I'll at you right. I'll at you right now. I mean, I personally like tidy and clean things. What shocker! Um, so I find it easier to think in minimalist spaces. But uh. um, but equally, I'd I'd faff as much over like which stone bowl would sit in the center of a table as you see <laughs> on its own. Yeah. Which, so. <laughs> which grey stone bowl will sit in the center of a pure white table with nothing else around it? And how Genuinely. many inches from the edge should it be? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I feel seen. Let's move on. Okay. Um, I'm a feminist, but I recently joined a gym with a Turkish spa element. And on the nude women's days, yes. I'll be honest, Deborah, my thoughts are not always innocent. <gasps> are not always pure in the Turkish bath. No. Or not. I, I tried to keep them <laughs> this is, neutral you, and platonic, and I know a man couldn't say this, but there's some lovely views in there, Deborah. Lovely. I think you've mistaken this for an actual Catholic uh, confession. I booth. have. <laughs> you've gone into such a Catholic mode. My thoughts are not always pure, Father. <laughs> yeah, I have. I've had impure thoughts in the Turkish bath. <laughs> 
<laughs> say, I would suggest, say, three Hail Maya Angelous and an hour Emily Pankhurst. <laughs> I actually, I can do that and it would make me feel a lot better. Thank you so much. I try to keep it pure and I'm not judgmental on anybody or, or like thinking about things in a, in a critical way. It's just women's bodies are just are beautiful. Bang. They're just Yeah, bang. they're very beautiful. I'm a recent convert to your people. Yes, welcome. <laughs> but mm. uh, turns out being straight was only a phase. Um Good, but uh, yeah, you grow out of it. You grow out of it. You grow out of it. You grow. You go. Yeah. You grow up, and you realize you're not really yes, straight. Yeah. That's that's the silly. That's the whimsy of a child born in a country where, in various states, homosexuality was still illegal, and certainly just not a seen. whimsical. Fa- exactly. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about uh, the ways of the lesbian. And um, then you went to a Turkish bath. I'll be honest. I didn't know a penis stood up and got erect until I saw one. What? I didn't know. I didn't know about erections. Yeah, no. I knew it went into you, but I thought it was like. Did you just like think it had was... to be summed in? I thought it was like putting a marshmallow into a post box. <gasps> oh, no. Yeah, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I was shielded. There was no sex yet... education at school. I was in a Wait, weird is... cult where there was no Hold sex on. allowed. So, but you no masturbation you allowed. Thumb... You thought penises had to be summed in, and yet you were straight. If you've not seen any imagery, you don't know what to fantasize about. Now, I think some people do, some people just do. Yeah. But anyway, not to upstage wow. the views in the Turkish bath by any means with images of penises, flaccid penises, <laughs> trying to get into orifices, just to be very clear. I've ruined this, but I'll tell you what, there's a hell of a lot of queer women out there going, could you shut the fuck up, Deb, and let Catherine Bohart talk more about her feelings in the Turkish bath? About all the boobs, all the boobs. I hope nobody um, knows me in my Turkish baths because they're probably going to be like, I'll just cover up because the pervert's here. But it's just, it's hard not to look at like like all of those. And also, in I thought I would hate that kind of nudity because I have a lot of like, you know, hang-ups. And actually, it's a space where I'm really breaking my own rule because I think it's a lovely space for me because my body just is I don't feel Mm. objectified or I don't it just is it's not uh, and yet there I am going well I just am but she's got lovely baps and that's not great it feels different when it's same sex I do think that it does feel different there's always something of the sleepover to it there's something of the, the the friendship and the sleepover and the loveliness and the and the softness and the friendship. I completely agree with you. And it's nothing that I wouldn't say out loud. That's the thing is, it's a very quiet spa, so I don't. But if 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 it was a chatty spa, I would say everything I'm thinking, which is, you know, just lots of compliments. Well, it's like that scene in Sex and the City where that woman says, oh, I'd love your breasts. And she says, I'd kill for your thighs or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, where women just appreciate each other. I'm willing for the purposes of wrapping this section up to pretend that it's as pure and innocent as that. Yeah. I'm just saying, I feel it's in the same realm. Uh, you're right. I'm a feminist, but I'm not going to join the revolution without a really nice nail polish. I've just got to that point now where I feel... <laughs> more confident and more, I just love the shininess of it. I feel like, yes, I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. I just like the shine. I like the fact that I don't bite my nails if it's on. I feel like a pro. I feel like a grown up. I feel like a professional. I feel like a success. I feel more successful with nail polish. Judge me. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge you because I don't think that's less rational than putting horns on a helmet to feel your best in, in revolution or war. I don't Excellent think point. Excellent you know, point. I don't think it's less rational than those shiny, shiny suits of armor. I don't think it's less rational than a cape. I don't think it's less rational than a boot. I think it's absolutely fine. And frankly, a long time ago, by my own standards, I rationalized my manicures as an act of queerness because you got to keep those nails short. And, you know, it, it, for me, it's basically like preening my peen and I have no objections to it. Well, I can't top that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> have you got a final I'm a feminist but Catherine Bohart? Yes, I'm a feminist but... I am so deep in marriage at first sight UK right now. (gasps) 
you would not oh. think I was the feminist. Oh, what? I'm, 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 and it's so, so problematic. It's so toxic. It's so, I mean, it has, you know, I can pretend it has some elements that redeem it. It doesn't. It's just absolute gender binary, heteronormativity, even with a gay couple, um, absurdity. And I absolutely love it. Can I tell you, audience, can I tell you, don't go in, don't go in. Goldfinger rules. Yeah. Don't go in, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because you go in and you go in to judge and you go in to look at what Catherine Bohart is watching and go, well, oh, this yeah. is outrageous. Oh, yeah. And it is possible that you might find it sticky, that you might find it smorish, that you might then get involved with the They make it in a certain way. There's a secret recipe. There's something they're doing to make it magnetic. So don't go in because you know, you know it'll sap your life and your morality so don't go into Married at First Sight. Stay away, I say. But if you like are it's... already in, if you're already in. <laughs> at Catherine we... Bohart and tell her what you think. At Catherine Bohart and please do tell me because I have so much to talk about. It. Okay. But Deborah clearly doesn't want to and that's fine. No, no, no. You may tell me and our audience three things that you think, three opinions on Married and, and our listeners who are watching will get that. Okay. What are the things? Thank you so much. One, the gay experience in that show is like circa 2005. The entire production team and cast are like, have you heard? We're talking to gays now. They're so oh, wow. smug with it. It's like, wow, we are not your gift. The nice thing about it, if you need to rationalize it as compared to something like Love Island, is that you have the existence of these so-called experts. P.S. They're terrible, but let's call them experts who do occasionally point out the toxicity and sexism Ooh. involved, which makes you think like, yes, there's a tempering force to this absolute horse shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast. I did not ask that. And asking for permission doesn't feel feminist, so I'm going to persist. Number three, let's talk about Morag. Please tweet me. <laughs> <laughs> They have nothing further uh, to say at this time. Thank you. Excellent. You can swear on this podcast because we broadcast it on Her Majesty's Internet, where there has been swearing before. Amazing. I'm so fucking glad to hear it. Wonderful. From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Catherine Bohart, and our very special guests, Ria Lina and Rachel Samani, talking about myths. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Super, super. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Catherine Bohart, and we are talking about myths. Are there any myths about Irish women or bisexual women that you would like to bust right here, right now, baby? Yeah, I absolutely think there are. I mean, myths around bisexual women are abundant, right? That it's just for attention, um, that we're just trying to steal your boyfriend, that we just want to have a threesome with you, that we're greedy. And it's a really tricky one to bust because all of those things may be true, but that's based on our personality types, not our sexuality. It doesn't uh... mean that they're not, not inherent to our sexuality. Like, maybe I want to steal your boyfriend. Probably not. Maybe I want to have a threesome with you. Probably not. Maybe I'm greedy, but that's not because of my sexuality. That's because of reinforced notions of sex as being taboo in my childhood and now a newfound enjoyment and freedom in it. Um, <laughs> but Mr. and Irish women, I think, are interesting because I think Irish women have been perceived a lot as of, is expected of them, that they are. Mm. It's a weird myth that they are endlessly capable and robust and willing not as able but willing to carry the weight of their entire families upon themselves mm. and I think that while that myth creates strong women it also weighs and bears down and kind of eliminates the needs of those women in in those families and I think it's it's one that's got to be unpacked and unpicked because it's tedious and it does not leave space for Irish mothers particularly to have any desires or needs of their own. That is so interesting. I'm going to read you something that I read this week uh, from Matthew McConaughey now. Hold. <laughs> that is Hold. not who I thought you would say you were going to read to me from, no. from but please, no. please do. Uh, this, all this right, was... all right, all right. <laughs> That's Let's quite good. It. Thank you. I'm liking that. I need my nine hours sleep, so I might not be awake until 9am. Camilla, my wife, needs a lot less. 
and she'll already be up getting the kids ready. My mornings are pretty spartan. Check myself mentally and physically. Read a little daily stoic. Grapefruit and eggs for breakfast. Then he goes on to say, I need my time in solitude. And he says, my wife's been very good at being someone who kind of can tell when my spider senses are going. I need to go get on the frequency again. I need to go get some quiet time. I need to go get away from all the noise. I need to hear myself think, form some opinions. So uh, she'll at the same time or even before come up to me and go, I think you need a little road trip with the YOW. I'll be like, yes, I think you're right. And then he just goes off for weeks at a time. But he says, I just can't help checking in on them sometimes, even though I'm meant to be off getting some me time. I just can't help myself because that's how great a dad and husband I am that I occasionally call them. And I'm like, I know your face is so (laughs) horrified, but I'm like, oh, you need more sleep. She doesn't really need any sleep. She doesn't need away time. She doesn't go off on the road for six weeks at a time. And it's just the lack of awareness around that. She, by the way, The amount of times you said I when you were reading that. I I mean, it's extraordinary. I need, I need, I need. need. Uh, It's nothing about what she needs or nothing about what she likes at all. Wow. And the best thing about her is she knows when I need what I need. That's her most distinct characteristic there. She can tell when I need what I need, which is the most important thing because it's what is important. Exactly. She is, I mean, if you see a picture of her, she looks absolutely extraordinary. And she is is. a model and designer. So it's not like she doesn't have her own career and aspirations as well as the full-time job of being a parent. I just love that he gets, she doesn't need as much sleep as me. And she actually says, I think you need to go away for a while. And I think uh, you might, uh, I just think if your wife comes up and goes, do you need to just go away for three weeks? She hates you. <laughs> there might be a hidden message, Matthew McConaughey. It might not all be about your alone time. It might be about her going, oh, please leave. Oh, yeah. if you say I one more time, yeah. I'm going to tell you to fuck, fuck off for three weeks. Yeah, she hates you. Um, but that's the thing about women don't need as much sleep. Women, the, the absolute myth about women, she'd rather I go away. She'd rather. It's so fascinating to me. The thing is, sure, she likes it the way she likes it. And if I tried to help, it would just be wrong. <laughs> I've deliberately never learned how she likes it. Yeah. Our guest today is multi-award winning comedian and writer who also happens to have a Bachelor of Science in Experimental Pathology and a Master of Science in Forensic Science and a PhD in Virology. Topical! She has also written and presented her own Channel 4 documentary that revealed the truth behind the myths that surround East Asian women in Britain. Please welcome Rhea Lena! Hello! Thank you so much for having me. So Rhea, you Mm. are a comedian. I am now. (laughs) But you have a PhD so you're a doctor of viruses. Are you thinking you may have jumped ship from being a doctor of viruses to go towards comedy too early, given for the last 18 months we've not been allowed to leave the house and do comedy, but doctors of viruses have been very much in demand? They have been in demand, but um, okay, full disclosure, I am an, I did herpes viruses, so less useful <sighs> in the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, you were sneaking out to do the naughty, naughty when you shouldn't have been. But, uh, <laughs> but overall, I think some of the fundamentals are the same um, on how not to catch. So you were a doctor of herpes. Uh, well, I that was that was I, dare I say my virus of choice. That was the one that I focused on. <laughs> in, <laughs> I, I, it didn't. I didn't choose it. It chose me. Okay. So I can see just... why you ended up as a comedian because that is a full time job batting off. You're basically being heckled all day by the other scientists. When they're like, doctor, doctor of herpes, lol. And then you have to come up with all these killer comebacks and eventually you've got a full routine. Is that what happened? Do you know what? Actually, ironically, I was one of the most unfunny people in the lab. I mean, there were amazing minds and amazing scientists and they'd get up and do their talks and they'd say something and everybody would laugh. And then I'd get up and do mine and I'd say something and they'd stare at me. And I think that's what told me I was playing the wrong rooms. Were you all oh. simultaneously showing photos of herpes? Because that will stun a room into silence. <laughs> Was it a PowerPoint? Well, no, no. Okay. So again, if we're going to go, if we're going to go deep, I actually worked on the sequence data of the DNA of 
of herpes viruses, or the, you know, I worked on the sequence of their of their genomes. I say DNA, but of their genomes is what I was working on. I'm not a medical doctor, thank goodness, because I have issues with flesh. A lot of things can happen to flesh, and maybe it's because I studied herpes viruses that I'm like, you know, don't get too close. Let's elbows. I'm loving elbows. Can I just say this Me whole too. elbows thing? I am all over that. Do you do both sorts of herpes? Because, right, cold sores are herpes, yeah. But then... Oh, there's eight. Okay, well, well here we go. Oh, Here's a myth. Great. There are there are actually eight human herpes viruses. There are eight viruses that infect humans. Number one is your cold sores. Number two is your, your naughty sores down there, your genital herpes. And then you've got three As through eight. As a doctor, eight. sorry, just can we just pause right there? As yeah. a doctor... Are you allowed to say naughty sores? Aren't you meant to be able to use the full? You know, it's only because I haven't checked with you beforehand how graphic we're going to be on this. Oh, full, full, go for it. Go for it. What would you say okay. if you're in the lab? You presumably, I'd love the idea in the lab you call them naughty sores. <laughs> but if you're in the lab, what do you call them? Well, they're, they're genital sores, aren't they? Oh, it's simplex two. Simplex two. Simplex two. Yeah. What simplex are the other six? Yeah, sorry. So go on, three sorry. Is, and question: so, Do they get? Do they increase in naughtiness? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> it depends where they show up, Catherine. Oh, That's great! Really the this truth is it. So, please tell me where. So number three is chicken pox or shingles. What? Right. Yes, I know. That's the biggest drop is that we've probably all, we all have herpes in us. We've <gasps> all got a herpes virus. And herpes isn't just for Christmas, it's for life. Because once you're infected, it stays with you forever. That's why some people get cold sores coming back again and again when they're stressed. Because it just kind of wakes up and goes, hey, we having a party? Stress party. And then out it comes. What? For a little, for a little dance along the lip line. Um, or the, you know, the genital line. line, depending. Yeah, yeah depending or the lip line, you've indeed. Got <laughs> you've got um, number four, Epstein-Barr, which is glandular fever. You've got cytomegalovirus uh, and six and seven. And those ones, you're less likely to know if you have them. Six and seven are like childhood uh, fevers. You probably get them when you're kids. And then eight is Carposi's sarcoma virus, which is very common in Mediterranean men and anyone who's immunocompromised. What the oh. frick? So those, are your, those are your eight that make up the, the party. But so no bum stuff. Well, if you're into it, oh. yeah, you can get you can get. You can get your naughty sores around the back. Can you? Where do you want it? Wow. Where do you want it delivered? You know. Wow. Uh, I, I, I would if like to return well the package, please. <laughs> yeah. It's the package is ripped. That, abort. Abort. The package is ripped. It's not often that Tom Selinski audibly laughs because he normally tries to keep himself out of this, but he is <laughs> roaring and he's shoved his fist into his mouth. <laughs> oh no! Well, if he gets sores along his hands, you know what happened. Um, <gasps> wow. Wow. Well, this is a revelation. So why do you study herpes? Because we know we can't cure it. Or were you looking for the cure? No, actually, well, I my thesis, which I still think is fascinating, I was looking at the evolution of herpes viruses alongside their hosts because they're quite an old virus that goes back centuries and centuries in terms of the relationship that it has with the species that it infects. So some of the questions are, you know, which came first, the chicken or egg? Did we give herpes this particular protein or did it give us a particular protein to function? And gene swapping, because it comes in and stays with you forever, there can be a little bit of crossover. But can we then use that knowledge of this passing back and forth between two separate, you know, genomes between the, the virus and, and its host, i.e. human? Can we use that for gene therapy? Could we help deliver missing genes to people that are otherwise having to use medicines or other therapies because they're missing one particular gene, for example? So you're not trying to cure herpes. You're trying to use herpes to cure other things. Yes. Use it as a viral vector. A viral vector. A viral vector to deliver medicines. and A viral loop. Yeah, we're wow. Basically, can we give herpes a chance to apologize for the centuries of suffering that we've put up with? Can herpes be Can the unlikely the unlikely bearer of good things? Because to yeah. date, herpes has just been a big old bummer. Yes. Yeah. From childhood onwards. Literally the case of <laughs> Catherine Bohart. Major bummer. I please don't want I don't want that to be my narrative on this episode of Guilty Feminist. Yeah, you brought it no. up. You did I say know. very specifically, I need to ask a personal question here on behalf of my friends. <laughs> Is what they are experiencing. Where can I put Survirex of- cream? Is that fine for everything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My God, chicken pox and shingles is chicken herpes. Pox. Yes, it is. What a rebrand. But not a pox. 
Get, I know, That's go figure. That's mad. Imagine if everyone started talking about the like herpes breakout at the daycare. You'd be like, oh, but that's what it is. I know, I know. I think it's probably why we renamed it. That's probably for safety. <laughs> oh, so it's called chicken pox so children could go cluck, cluck, cluck and it's sort of innocent. Yeah, and they're really? not like, the nanny had to go home because the kid has herpes. <laughs> or the, yeah, or, <laughs> oh. Just home? That's that's where we send the man. <laughs> Just home. Okay. So wow. So if you have a child and that child has chickenpox, uh, this is a real public service announcement from the guilty feminist. That is a big old herp. Yes. So and probably one of the fevers that they have. At some point, they're going to come home. They're going to be feverish for a couple of days. Maybe they go a bit bright pink because they're hot. That could also be six or seven. Herpes six virus. or seven. Yeah, yeah. Human human herpes virus six or seven. That could be one of them as well. Question. Sorry, we didn't actually come here for a science lesson, but I'm so interested. And by the way, if this had been science in school, I would have stuck with it more. But here's my question. If you get, if your kid comes in with herpes and you get it from them, can you get like a different type of herpes from, like if your kid has chicken pox, you presumably can't catch herpes in a general sense from them. Can you? Well, no, if they have chicken pox, then you could, if you haven't had it already, normally no, you have it you once can catch- and you never... You can catch chickenpox, but it wouldn't present as a different simplex. Well, no, it could, but that's what I mean. With chickenpox specifically, it can present a shingle. So sometimes you have chickenpox as a child, and then later on in life, you go, "What's this around my middle? Or why am I, you know, why am I experiencing these weird aches and pains? Or my skin's gone funny?" And it shingles, and that could be your chickenpox infect, you know, infection that you live with representing as shingles but so Catherine if you're trying to write off genital herpes by saying I it's caught it from I did, a kid with I did a lot of babysitting I did a lot of babysitting <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. I, no. I don't even have herpes oh well, maybe I do now now I'm like who knows sounds like we all have it this is insane I had I had chicken pox as a kid this is mad I feel like that's going to be the trailer for this episode, isn't it? Is Catherine going, I don't even have herpes. I don't even have herpes. <laughs> it's, ha- are we capturing the visual of this? Because I think it would make an excellent viral for Instagram. <laughs> I don't even have herpes. I don't even have herpes. Really the lady doth protest too much. Ugh, and then it's cut just- that with, but I babysit a lot. People would be so confused. <laughs> No, just it's to not be clear, me, it's the creepy toddlers with herpes. No, no, Catherine Bohart <laughs> doesn't have herpes. That we just want that out there. I'll put it on a t-shirt, okay? And the, I'll and wear the it toddlers in have chicken pox, and the toddlers have chicken pox. Let's <laughs> yes. be clear. Toddlers have herpes. Not Catherine Bohart is the t-shirt I'll be wearing all Edinburgh Festival, <laughs> just as a public service <laughs> announcement. I don't want anybody thinking the wrong thing from this. And Thank that, you, Deborah. Yeah, this has been really informative. So are there any other myths? Because we're going to go on to your doc in a bit as well about the myths in your doc. But are there any other myths about herpes or viruses? Because <laughs> viruses operate, they're not called a virus for nothing. They're all called a virus because they all share things. In this age of the great virus, are there... Is are that th- what we're calling it? Is this going to be the great virus? And then in another four, like 20 years, we're going to have world, world virus war. too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the moment, oh, it's the great gosh. virus. And it'll then be world virus too. In, oh, oh. in don't in wish 20s. that upon us. Okay. No, I seriously hope not. But I'm I'm just riffing. I, you're the scientist, and that is clear. <laughs> so, any other myths or things that you think our guilty feminist audience would like to know, as women and people of minority genders, as feminists, as anything we should know, as concerned citizens of the world about how viruses work. Or myths that occur. I believe there are a few myths going about around about coronavirus at the moment and vaccines. Oh, so many. I mean, actually, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you should ask me one because there's okay. so many of them that it'd be more interesting to know what you went. You know what? I heard this and it sounded plausible and now I'm not sure. Okay. Because I get why there's so much misinformation out there because there's so much going on right now. That even individual scientists, and I'll hold my hands up and go, look, I can't read every paper. I can understand the basics, but I can't read every paper and tell you up to date what's happening right now with COVID and all the rest of it and, you know, understand all the stats. But I totally understand why people are trying to understand it and then maybe getting led down the wrong path. And I wouldn't totally blame them for that because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Well, everyone in my immediate circle is getting vaccinated, but I do see people on my Facebook feed saying, oh, I'm nervous about vaccines because they couldn't possibly have had time to test them yet. What is your response to that? I have been double vaccinated. I am extremely 
concerned that everyone who can gets vaccinated. Um, but all the myths surrounding vaccines, do you have anything on that, Ria? You know, what's interesting is they often say, hey, the last, you know, the next fastest vaccine that was developed was four years. So this is too fast. And I go, yeah, that was four years in the 1950s. So actually, that was incredibly fast in the 1950s. And it's almost as if people don't give science credit for coming a long way in the last 70 years. We've, we've made a lot of achievements since the 1950s. I mean, computers, for example, uh, have shrunk all the way from the size of a house down to being able to be held in your hand, you know, mobile phone. The power of this mobile phone in my hand is, is more than a computer in the 1950s. And they did a vaccine in four years that worked. So the fact that we've done it in a year to 18 months isn't that incredible if you actually put it in context of time. But secondly, we had a world pandemic when we said, ah, we need to test this vaccine. We had more people coming forward and volunteering for that than have probably ever volunteered in the history of man for any kind of trial, you know, ever. So these are some of the most tested vaccines that we've ever developed because everybody was really, really interested in them working. And there were a lot of people going, I'll volunteer my body for that. I'll step forward. And we have to go, thank you so much for doing that because I'm a scientist and I still wasn't brave enough to do that. So we have to say thank you to those thousands. And it was tens of thousands of people. The third thing you have to realize about vaccine trials is that we cannot ethically give someone a vaccine to something and then infect them with it on purpose to see if it works. So we can't go, well, let's come up with a vaccine for chickenpox and then, inf you know, give us all the vaccine and then hold infected toddlers in front of our faces and go, breathe. You know, that's not ethical. And so the other reason that vaccine trials can take quite a long time is when you go, hey, volunteers, we're going to give you a vaccine against disease A. Go live your life and let us know if you catch disease A. We have to wait and go, well, did they not catch disease A because they never came across it in their normal everyday life? Did they not catch disease A because the vaccine actually works? Or did they catch disease A because the vaccine doesn't work? That takes time. Now, when you have COVID everywhere and you're trying to test whether or not your vaccine works, and we did a lot of these trials in places like Brazil, for example, where we knew it was going nuts last year in Brazil. And so we had, you know, a trial down there and we infected people, you know, we injected, I'm sorry, mm, there's a typo. Um, we injected people with the trial vaccine and then sent them into the communities. And guess what? They got exposed pretty quickly to COVID and we were able to figure out pretty quickly whether or not the vaccinated were being protected and at what level and how. That's why it happened at the rate that it happened. Not because uh, science needs more time. I think we should give science more time because science, you know, loves time. Don't get me wrong. but we had lots of time and people and people working on it. What a comprehensive answer. Yeah, incredibly comprehensive. I'm sorry there weren't more punchlines. No, because no, I think that, no, I, I love it. Uh, me too. But further to this myth, and I want to give like best case, I don't want to go like pick red herrings, but like one thing that the only, the people I know who have not been vaccinated happen in my mm. circumstance to be incredibly rational people. And they are older. And they live in an isolated community. And the reason they've chosen not to be vaccinated is par in part because they live in an isolated community, but more specifically because they believe that what hasn't been tested in the trial is long term consequences of very the true. vaccine. Yes, very, very and, true. And that I think is the only I've been vaccinated twice. <laughs> well, I'm ready for my top up. I was like, put it in my eyeballs. But I <laughs> would... I guess that's the only one where I've gone, I don't know how to dissuade you from that notion. So I'd love to know what the, what, what do I tell them? Well, well, no, that is true. That is true that we can't tell now what the long-term effect of anything will be. People keep going, how long does long COVID last? And I go, well, in 10 years, we'll know whether or not it lasts 10 years. Because until we have the time to be able to figure that out, we can't actually say definitively this will be fine or not. Um, there can be effects that take longer than a week or two to figure out. So we already know the immediate effects, okay? We've, we've seen some of that. We've seen, unfortunately, some people who have lost their lives or, or been disabled by their vaccines, as we know from the clotting and, and other things. We know that Guillain-Barr is a risk of some of them, which is a, a nerve-damaging disease, a little bit like MS. So we know that there are some quite drastic side effects from these vaccines, um, and that's 
can be true of other medications. We always are told of side effects of all medications, and there is no medication that's going to be perfect for everybody all the time. Um, if you think of across the planet, there are people who are allergic to tomatoes. And they seem quite innocuous. They're innocuous to me. They're fine to me. And other people, they're deadly. So just the diversity of humanity means that there's always going to be some effect to somebody somewhere. And again, we're doing this at millions. We're vaccinating millions of people. Um, that said, there are things that can take longer to show up uh, that will take more time. But I would throw back to those people, if they're worried, you know, it's their risk unless it's a large community and it's the community's risk that they're taking by not vaccinating because of what we've heard of this term herd immunity. But bottom line, I would love to know of any medications that you've gone, I put this in me and the effects, I didn't see the effects for three to five years. It's very hard to test that given everything else that you do in life. It's very hard to pinpoint and go, oh my gosh, this happened to me today. I blame that hot dog I ate three years ago, or I blame that off-the-shelf medication that I took three to five years ago. It's very hard to say that it was definitely that and not anything else that happened between. So if you do know of something where you go, oh no, definitely there's this potion that when you drink it in seven years, your hair goes green. Tell me. I'd well, love to, I'd, I'd be interested. I think people equate it with thalidomide, but uh, thalidomide wasn't from a vaccine. Vaccines, I, I was reading about this, and vaccines well, work the same way. And we already had to vaccinate for SARS, which was another kind of COVID. So they did know how to put a vaccine together more or less. And they do know the long-term effects of the vaccines for SARS. Is that true? Well, okay, let's let's deal with thalidomide. Thalidomide was a tragedy. That was an awful, awful tragedy. And it's the perfect example for this podcast because it's a tragedy of the patriarchy. Uh, because back when they were testing medicines, and they still do this today, they did not test thalidomide on women before they passed it for general use in the population. So they said, yeah, we'll test it on a bunch of guys. They went, hey, guys, any problems with your babies? The guys went, no, none of us got pregnant. And they went, great, let's use it. And then they allowed it to be given out to pregnant women uh, without knowing that it actually was devastating. And so that's where we learned, hey, maybe we should test the medicines on the people we're going to give them to before we give them to them. And we still have that problem today. We still will go, we need people for this trial. Nobody pregnant, please, or nobody, you know, women over this age or nobody that's in menopause. Or we still, as women, aren't getting the same fair treatment. You know, they'll test on men all the time. They're like, hey, ain't these guys great guinea pigs? Because, you know, they ain't pregnant, they ain't menopausal, they ain't hormonal, let's use them. But with women, we're not getting the same data before things are being released to market because we're not having as, you know, and I don't blame, I mean, I'll be honest with you, any pregnant woman that goes, test on me, I'd be going, honey, do you maybe need to have a sit down and a chit chat about, <laughs> about, about that decision? So it is a tricky one. It's not an easy answer, but I'm just saying that that's what happened with thalidomide, is that they quite arrogantly just assumed that, oh, if we test this on men, it's fine for everybody. Yeah. That's what happened with thalidomide. Mm. It's so nice listening to somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about. Or someone who's just been beat up online about this over and over and over again for 18 months. <laughs> I am so... No, but the fact that that may, has made you more patient in explaining it to us and more thorough rather than more embattled and more defensive is actually a great testament to you. So I was just coming in with a compliment. Sorry. Oh, mm. on you go. On you go. Bless you, love. <laughs> Do, do, do you know, but genuinely, the more that this happens, the more I go, you know what, I am happy to explain this till the cows come home because I think it's not being explained enough. Yeah. We've got too many people just, just chomping at the bit. You go, I will explain it to anyone who is open and willing to listen and go and just admit that they're scared. I mm. I get that. Do you know what? I, I get why you might not want to put this vaccine in your body because if you don't understand science, you don't know what's in it. I don't like to, you know, snort coke that I haven't cut myself. So... <laughs> You don't, right? <laughs> you don't just buy a baggie from a guy in a in a in a nightclub and trust that it's you know not mixed with angel dust. You you do that stuff yourself if you care. If you care, my body's a temple. Especially <laughs> if you're moment. pregnant. This is a, this right. is a, this is now yes, a, so true. If you're pregnant, yes. make sure you cut that coke yourself. Exactly. Cut your like, own coke. Take home message. Take home <laughs> message from this yeah. episode. Really, just be, be aware. Where are you getting your MDMA? If you are three months pregnant to nine months pregnant, that's all we're mm. saying. Yes. 
Just be a better mom. You, you know what I mean? That's it. I mean, what's in your garage? Really? Boxes? Well, some of us have our own lab because we care. Okay? We care. <laughs> we make our own. This part is the jokey part, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some serious science parts, and now this is a comedy part. I feel the need to say that. Um, your Channel 4 documentary oh. revealed the truth behind the myths surrounded East Asian women in Britain. Could you tell us more about that, Ria Lena? I can. Uh, so this was looking at a lot of the ideas, and I think it's better now than when I made the documentary. I made that a few years ago. But we were looking at the views that were all very quite submissive, sexually submissive, the whole sex kitten thing. And I think actually a lot of it is to do with status is, oh, well, if you look at us as sex kittens and you also see us lesser, you know, we do a lot of service positions, um, especially Filipinos. I'm Filipino. So nursing, working in care homes, cleaning, all of these things of, you know, sort of those infrastructure roles in society and how that isn't actually very true. I mean, definitely in the Philippines. And and I think you'll you'll agree that Asian women are actually kick-ass women. We are strong, mm. tough. And the Philippines is actually a matriarchal society. It is higher than the UK when it comes to male-female parity across a wide number of, of, you know, in terms of jobs, in terms of pay, in terms of just equal access to things in society, the Philippines is really quite equal. I remember somebody telling me that the Filipino men would come to the West and then work for a male manager and really struggle with that because they're so used to working for female managers because it makes sense. You use the men on the floor to do all of the grunt work because they're physical and they can, you know, they can sustain that and use the women to actually organize it all because they're quite good at organizing and running households and they run the warehouse. And so it's flipped from what we would have over here, which is maybe women across the, the factory floor and one male foreman. And so we were just looking at at that. Um, I mean, I was raised, my mother is the strong parent in my parenting duo. And then her mother was the strong one. So I've just been raised by a long line of women that just come in and go, this is my household. This is how things will go. My father has cooked my mother every meal since I can remember, serves it to her. She gets the best cut first because she's the matriarch and then the rest of us follow. And then eventually he sits down and eats a meal. <laughs> That's how it works at my house. Wow. Then I married a man who can't cook. And I, my mother is so disappointed. <laughs> I know. I married a man who cooks and I recommend it. Um, oh, he doesn't cook as much great. as he used to. And frankly, I want to speak to the manager. <laughs> but that's, that's me. you isn't yeah, it I'm that's you yeah it should I'm be yeah. it should be it's, you <laughs> it's 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 tricky this is really really interesting what's the documentary called uh oh it's called a bit of oriental which i don't know is as pc as it should be but a bit of oriental uh, because actually again when we made it in britain we use the term oriental to describe far east stations Mm -hmm. And that was fine. And then the United States rhetoric started coming over and the United States, you know, and Asian Americans were like, we don't like that word. That means, you know, that is of the East, but East of what? Uh, it makes you sound like a rug, all of this sort of stuff. And then it changed. And they say Asian, but over here, Asian, we think of sort of the Indian subcontinent and that sort of, you know, North, Southwest yeah, Asian, Asian part. Asia, yeah. Of, yeah. So now I believe that we also, we also use Asian, Far East Asian. But the documentary was called A Bit of Oriental at the time. But that, you know, that's still what people say. Do you want to go out? You know, people still say it. Do you want to go out for a, and then they won't say a Chinese. They'll say something else. Um, I hope they don't still say that. No, oh, I they know. do. do oh, they? not well. Uh, yeah, I think that's still quite common. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry that the world is as it is all the time. Thank you. I accept that apology on behalf of the world. <laughs> I do. It's a it's a fascinating subject, and I don't think we can educate ourselves enough on it. I think, like, especially because of the ubiquity with which there are often pornographic representations of like, mm. Asian women, but then also sexually, yes, submissive, but also I think like almost pedestaled versions of womanhood for Asian women. For example, I am. Um, this was ten years ago. I was in drama school, and I was uh, on a course with an Asian woman who asked me a very simple question when she found out that I was like, we were talking about queerness and she was like, what do you think when you see two Asian women holding hands? And I was surprised to find my answer was probably friends. And she was like, that's insane. Mm. And I was like, yeah, it is. You're right. Now that you say that, like there isn't like a presumption of 
like queerness or presumption of sexual, I guess, like. You don't assume two Asian women holding hands agency. Are, are, are a couple or a, a romantic couple. Yeah, because, well, no, I'm, I do now. You, you, <laughs> but yes, I, that but was the, the assumption that you made. But I didn't because we have this representation, I think, in European media a lot of the time of like cutesy, like almost girlish mm. versions of Asian women who don't have sexual agency or hypersexualized pornographic imagery. But we don't necessarily get to the personhood of that. And I do think there's still loads of work to be done on that. It's. I do mean, you agree, Ria? Yeah, well, it's that is that is huge part of it is that Asian women are overly sexualized, but Asian men are under sexualized, and that's a mm-hmm. and that's a problem in Asia itself. I mean, in Japan, you you know they've had declining birth rates for years because they can't get their men and their women to like each other because they each have different tastes and and it's not quite gelling together. And then you've got the insult of you know the soy boy insult, uh, which is thrown at um Asian it's it's a very insulting thing for Asian men generally but can be used now I've I've heard it used just to refer to an effeminate man uh you know which is to try and detract from their masculinity and therefore their sexuality and and everything that's wrapped up in that but yes because of the submissive view of Asian women we don't allow them the agency to choose what they would prefer we don't you know we don't have that but homosexuality is still you know, it's not legal in certain parts of Asia still. It, you know, it, it still isn't recognized as as okay. And I think there's actually quite a famous billionaire's daughter who is very openly lesbian who's just gone, no, oh, dad, I don't, you know, he's gone, I, I'm i going to, what's it called? Uh, what's the word? Will you disown you? I'm going to disown you. And she went, fine, I'm going to be me. And then, you know, and the, but she's a very successful businesswoman in her own right. And I think actually, it's interestingly, that also helped me. That whole myth helped me when I was doing comedy. When I first started doing comedy, I looked about 12. And audiences didn't want women on stage. And it was actually the women in the audience that didn't want women on stage. They wanted the cute men. They wanted to be able to, oh, you know, there's a lot of sexuality to comedy. These guys come up and tell us all and, you know, and they get all the groupies. But I was not a threat to the women in the audience because they would look at me. They would see this tiny little Asian woman that just was they go... My husband won't find her attractive. And they would allow their boyfriends and husbands to laugh at me. And I was able to, you know, and that I kind of slipped under the radar as being, you know, or, or they wouldn't accept if the husband did have a little fetish. He wasn't telling his blonde, busty wife that. And so I was, you know, able to to to, to get both sides of the audience, both members of the audience on side, as it were. Wow, that's really interesting. I definitely have had... Uh, women come up to me after gigs and say, I don't normally find women funny, but I've rested my bigotry for 10 minutes for you. Um, uh, oh, but- hands up. Who's heard that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every- yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And I, I completely agree with you. I think I look like a dolly on stage and I have mm. more, more permission to say sexual things because, and also because I'm talking about women often usually like queer dynamics. So it feels less threatening, but I also think you speak to a really good point, which is the presumption that if a European man is interested in an Asian woman or a European woman interested in an Asian man, that it must be fetishistic mm-hmm. rather than just individualized person person. attraction. I just want to put yeah. out there, guys, that I'm an incredible threat to everyone's boyfriend on stage. So <laughs> yeah. if yeah. you've ever yeah. seen me die at a gig, it's because the whole audience turned against me because they were so threatened by my sexuality and uh, just yeah. general fabulousness. <laughs> So it's very difficult for me in comedy because people look at me and go, mm. wow, um, who is that Sofia Vergara on stage, they say. Uh, they don't. <laughs> they don't. I think I'm equally uh, not a massive threat and I, I don't look like I'm going to steal your boyfriend. I, but that's a, it's weird that that's it. I, I just don't think Jack Whitehall ever goes out there going, I hope I don't look like I'm going to steal your girlfriend. Yeah. I just don't think that's a thing for guys because there's well, a different – sort of um, uh, engagement with the audience. Catherine's going to take umbrage. Not umbrage, but I do think that straight audiences often love camp, but definitively straight men who they find non-threatening in the same way that they don't necessarily get on board with a flamboyance and actually gay men. And I think Jack Whitehall and his ilk sometimes toe that line in a way that makes women feel less threatened and men feel less threatened. And Russell Brand, yeah, sort and of camp but yeah, sex appeal, but, open but that, shirt but that which we would diminish actually camp men for being, and it's it's interesting. But I, mm. so I don't know about that. But mm. I do have a question, which is 
Um, if we want to unpack some of those myths for ourselves on our own time, what, do you have any recommendations of things we should read or things we can do? I Well, I would say it's about reading literature by Asian authors, if you do want to. I mean, Wild Swans, Joy Luck Club. I mean, there's a lot of great cinema made from that literature as well. I I think that... Wild Swans is beautiful. Yes. Um, I think that people like... I remember discovering Sandra O oh in alternative... A Canadian cinema. And I loved her. I absolutely loved her and tried to keep following her, which was very difficult at the time that she first emerged. And then suddenly she appeared in Grey's Anatomy. And I went, I am your fan for life because of how much she was just breaking down boundaries. Uh, same thing with Michelle Yeoh, who's in everything. And I love her to absolute death in terms of, you know, in terms of how strong she is. And I think that we are slowly beginning to, but I personally, I'm becoming very aware now that the conversation is there. And I'm so pleased that we're now starting to see more ethnic diversity on screen, but it's going down the the ethnicity. So it was, now we're seeing more, you know, people, black people, brilliant, love it. Then we're starting to see more Indian Asians propping up, cropping up, you know, Big Bang Theory. He was a main, you know, he was one of the forecasts. Great. I'd like to see more Far East Asians. And I'm also waiting for the point where we finally get to a point where we're looking at just ethnic ambiguity and going, guess what? She's not got blonde hair and blue eyes. Not quite sure where her face is from, but she's just playing Jane. And uh, and that's where I think that's where we need to get to is we need to get to a point where we're not actively going, how do we learn more about this, but almost don't see it anymore because it's commonplace and because it's accepted and it's mm-hmm. and it's ubiquitous. And I think that's the same with all labels and everything that, that we're looking at is right now we're in a point where everybody's feeling the need to identify and go, these are my labels and this is what I am and this is how I identify. And that's important because we need the education of of the wide diversity of people out there. It's not just A and B. It's not just black and white. It's not just male and female. That's great. But eventually the aim is to get to a point where all these labels become irrelevant because we no longer go, I'm sorry, I don't know how to box you up. Mm. I don't know quite how to talk about you once you're gone, if you could tell me how. And, <laughs> and then we just get to the point where we're going, oh, that oh that was Jax. Yeah, Jax. Mm. And they go, great, love it, Jax, brilliant. Mm. And that's it. The dream is that people's humanity is more important than their identity. Yes. And I think the thing about being, if you are a white person who is also a male person, who is also a person without a disability, who's also gender conforming, who's also a heterosexual person, you will be seen as an individual. This doesn't mean that white, straight, uh, cis, non-disabled men have no problems, haven't had any struggles, don't have fears, don't have pains. It means that we see their struggles when we watch a film as human and not as black female struggles, not as uh, we, you're in a wheelchair struggles. We see them as human struggles. And mm. I th- we, we see them as uh, human struggles, not queer struggles. You know, everyone has pain. Everyone has challenge. Everyone has a disappointment. Everyone has, you know, I think sometimes when we talk about privilege, people get alienated and they go, oh, but I'm not privileged because mm. I've got all of this. And I'm thinking about, speaking in terms of access rather than privilege. Someone was saying to me the other day uh, in an event I was doing, you know, I went for this walk in the park and it was a beautiful day and was saying to a woman, oh my God, did you walk in the park this morning? It's such a beautiful day. And she was sort of saying, oh, I did. And I got sexually harassed twice. And he was like, I realized what a privilege it was to walk in the park without being sexually harassed. And I went, no, that's not a privilege. That's the base standard. The base standard should be we can walk in the park without being sexually harassed. When we put it on a, as a privilege, it implies there's something special. And I feel it should be the base standard. I feel you have access to the park without sexual harassment in it. And I don't necessarily have that access every day that I go into the park. I don't know. I'm putting this out there. Do you see what I mean by this? That sometimes the word privilege yeah. implies it's special. I think the privilege comes, and this is is what I'm. I will tell people if they go, "What's the difference?" The privilege is when we say violence against women, your privilege is not to be in that sentence, and you should be in that sentence. It should be men who commit sex crimes, not random thing that happens to women. Oh, how do we sort this out to women? Let's put more lights up. Let's give them rape whistles. Let's make let's their skirts tell them longer. To stay home. Yeah. Let's let's focus on the victim. No, no, no. Let's focus on the perpetrator. And your privilege is the fact that our society, our language, our way of discussing it, our way of trying to solve these problems doesn't focus on you. It focuses on the person that's already been 
victimized or the next person who might be victimized instead of going, hey, this person committed a crime. How do we stop the next person committing the same crime? That's your privilege. Your privilege is to actually have erased yourself from the conversation, which is only to do with you. Mm-hmm. All people That's who your share your identity. There'll be a lot of men listening who'll go, but I would never harass anyone in no, the park. And the, no, but- of course. But it is it is about identifying sex offenders as sex offenders. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are going to be multiple genders and identities within that part of the Venn diagram. That There's going to be loads of multiple overlaps of that. But it is to say... It is to actually go, you know what? We have a problem with sex offending. We have an issue with people committing violent crimes. Um, we have to stop shying away from the fact that the majority of them are, and, and please help me with the correct term, are, are, do we say male? Do we say, what do we even say at this point to say what they are? I'm not trying to put this on all men. Of course you don't put this on all men. No, at the but same time, but- all men shouldn't be able to go, well, I don't do it. So why are you putting me in the sentence? So I'm going, but- why am I in the, why am I why in the am violence the against women? Why am I in the violence against women sentence? I didn't do anything either. But also, I, I feel like you're both being very generous in like trying to make sure that you're giving very inclusive language when it's like, it is male violence in the same way that it's white racism. And I think that if your biggest concern when you hear those phrases is, but not me and not, oh my God, I can't believe that's happening. Mm-hmm. I, priorities? No, no, I agree. I agree. I'm just trying to reword stuff so that to build bridges and open minds. Because I'm course, starting to get course. to the point where I'm like, people are like, I, it's not that I, if I hear white supremacy, I don't go, I'm being blamed for every bad thing that happened. I understand in that sentence, I benefit from power structures and I benefit from them every day. I get out of bed and continue to benefit from them. And I can see absolutely how that sits. But if there are a lot of white people going, yeah, but you're a privileged white person because you live in North London and you have a podcast and you you went to Oxford University and I'm an unprivileged white person that, you know, is from a very unresourced part of the United Kingdom. And, you know, I want to be able to talk to people and go, hey, if you're feeling defensive about this, I get why. And Mm -hmm. here's all the ways in which I have privilege and access to things that you don't have access to. And here's the ways you have access to things that other people don't have access to and talk around in a, so that I just think every time I admit something rather than point a finger, I feel like it really works so that people go, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. This is not me going, poor, not all men. It's more me going, I want to fix the problem. I think so. And when you hear, I mean, if we think about it this way, we think tribally, we do think in tribes. And I think that's part of the problem with calling it, when we say violence against women, all of everyone who identifies with the women part of that sentence feels that something needs to be done because we identify with that tribe. Mm-hmm. And by not tribalizing the offenders by not going, okay, these sex offenders do belong to some tribes. We are not galvanizing those that would otherwise go, whoa, I don't want that in my tribe from actually stepping forward and going, we need to do something about this. When we hear, and this is human nature, when we hear of a tragedy in another country, when we hear of of, of a flood or a hurricane or a bomb going off, we care more when they go, this is how many people from our country were affected by it. And that's mm-hmm. why they report the news that way. Because if we go, oh my gosh, there was a flood in Germany, which there was, which was tragic. I think 200 people lost their lives from those floods. We see it as other and we go, oh my gosh, that's awful. But we don't necessarily empathize or sympathize with that until they go and there was a British family of five. And then we go, oh my gosh, that, then we suddenly feel it because we feel attached to that tribe. And the same thing works with if a crime is committed or anything else, whenever I hear that someone with Asperger's did something against the law, it hurts me personally because I'm going, oh, now people are going to people are going to think that that we do that and we don't do that. That is that person having, you know, that's not all of us. That's not on all of us. And by taking even men or male out of the sex offender conversation, because not all men do it, because they've managed mm-hmm. as a group to go, hey, we don't all do it. So leave us out of it. And we've all gone as a society. Oh, my gosh, I am so sorry. You're so right. We shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And we've allowed that to get away with them. None of that tribe is is turning to the small percentage that do sex crimes and going, stop it, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Or even, we need to do something about this. 
because our women and our colleagues and our friends and our neighbors are being affected by your behavior mm -hmm. and you need to stop. That's what we're doing by not putting them in the conversation. I think it's also another piece of othering. If it was any other group, it's because the dominant group is seen as human. So therefore, like if there's a mass shooting, then that we talk about that human, that individual and what might have led him to mass shoot. And I do say him because there aren't any, I don't think there are any women who have uh, done a mass shooting. Um, uh, California. There was one? Last year. There but also numerically, I think yeah. we can say they're male. <laughs> yeah. Like, like majority. Like majority, majority yes. If, Overwhelming majority. Uh, I mean, I will Google it because I'm interested, but how many women have done mass shootings? And it, mm. it will be the absolute exception. Um, and yes. No, it's not. It isn't the norm. It's not. I think you're so right. And actually, the inverse, I think, example of where this is done badly is um, TERFs. Galvan like utilizing the term lesbian as a defense for transphobia is incredibly ineffective because it certainly galvanized me, I think, to be like, hold on a second, you don't speak for me and other lesbians or bi people when you exclude trans people from the discussion or when. So I think you're right, naming things it can be effective or ineffective, but it certainly um, narrows the conversation, focuses the conversation in a mm. useful way. Uh, just to say that in the United States between 1982 and May 2021, there were 119 mass shootings by men, three by women. One by someone, must have been a man and a woman together. Yes, that um, was the couple in California. And one that was unknown or not released. So it is something like 96%, I wrote this in my book, so I know I researched it, 96% of homicides are committed by men. And of the 4% committed by women, many are self-defense or it's like built up over years of abuse. In other words, if men stopped killing, killing would stop. So instead of 119 mass shootings, and that's mass shootings, that's not shootings in America. There's many, many, many more thousands of shootings. And so I feel, and I think if you're a man listening to this, you would agree, if 119 of the 123 mass shootings were done by women, we would be saying women have a problem. Women are killing people. Women are on a rampage. We would. It would be, the gender would be remarkable. And I think if 119 of those shootings had been by queer people, it would be <laughs> remarkable. It would certainly be remarked upon. It would be, Right. If it was all people with a disability or it was gender non-conforming people, it would be a thing. It would, we would be talking about what is it with this community? What's the psychopathy of this community? We would be looking at it. But when it's maleness, we just don't. We don't go, we just go, well, that's peoplehood. That's humanity. That's not, and that's individual lone wolves who have got a problem. Well, we had the same issue with deciding whether or not to call incel killers terrorists. Mm -hmm. You know, remember this was debate of whether or not we should even, oh, no, we can't possibly give them that title. But we throw it out willy nilly as soon as the color of the person's skin is brown, regardless of what their motivations are. We go, that's terrorism. Mm -hmm. But when they're white, we go, oh, but that's slightly different. We go, yeah. why Why are we giving it that much more thought? Mm -hmm. um, that's where I feel the term privilege comes in. It's, it's not privilege as in an honor. And I think that's the problem is that the word privilege also means it, an honor or, you know, or something special, we use it in the same way to go, oh, it's been a real privilege to host this dinner or to 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 play this role. Um, or it's a privilege to go a to a fancy college or it's a privilege to, yeah. you know, to get a limo and be invited to a an award ceremony or something like that. But when we say, oh, it's a privilege not to be harassed in a park, I am asking if there are more, I'm not saying don't say that. I'm saying also, I think we should ask if there's a broader mm. vocabulary, because when we throw the word privilege too frequently, People start to not hear it, like, oh, you, you're on that. I just think yeah. their defences go up. And I do think we need to start reframing some of these conversations to get better results. And to because we've, I think everyone who was open to hearing about their privilege has probably been won over because we've said it so much. So yes. now we might need to start reframing it. I'm not saying it hasn't been useful. I'm saying, yeah, we build other people learn in different ways. They think in different ways. Some people are visual learners. Some people are uh, learn from models or stories or whatever. So I think reframing some of these things, it can be really useful and not going, you should just hear the word privilege and cave. Like, well, if they didn't, they mm. didn't. And I want the world to get better uh, more than I want to be right. Um, 
Rhea, we have had a real problem with Asian hate because of the pandemic. Yes. How has that impacted your community and what can feminists and specifically the Guilty Feminist listeners do to be allies through this? Is it still happening? Is this something that has has lingered? Is it, uh, can you talk, can you speak to this? It is still ongoing. It is ongoing and it's not going to stop because it's conflated with a lot of um, xenophobia, which is going on right now because of what's happening with China politically. Uh, you know, I mean, look at, we've just started the AUKUS against China with the nuclear submarines and that's all going to stir things up. So that's, it's all there and it's constantly there. And the pandemic has highlighted it and certainly has spiked and made it worse, but overall it's not going away. And I think it is just about well, this is what I was saying earlier. We need to, dare I say, normalize Asian people in society because we are here and we do exist in the West and we shouldn't be these cutesy, normal, ooh, that's special. Or when, you know, for example, in casting, and I think a lot of it is in the media, when you're casting someone, don't just cast a stereotype, you know, don't be like, oh, we need a sex worker. We need a, we need a nurse. We need a, a math geek. Just, you know, cast an Asian because people can be friends with Asians. Just make, make them, you know, even heavens, have a lead, have a lead role, be an Asian. Well, did you hear that Sandra Oh said when she got sent the Killing Eve script, she was like, she read it and said, oh my God, this is brilliant. Which part are you thinking of me for? And they said the lead. And she went, she said she cried because she doesn't get offered lead roles because she gets offered best friend Mm -hmm. roles or, you know, Asian roles or something. It's got to speak to her Asian-ness. And, uh, she was amazed by it. And I recently saw a lovely series with her afterwards. It was a limited series about her being the dean of a university. The chair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we I loved it. That. Yeah, me too. I, but I, I think, Rhea, you say such an important thing, which is that the I think that the pandemic highlighted Asian hate. I don't think it created Asian hate. Yeah. My first boyfriend was Malaysian. I We dated in Ireland 13 years ago. And a, like Asian hate already existed. We People have had a useful and convenient excuse or a lens through which to frame that. But it has absolutely always been there. Um, can I just say, and this is so, sorry, I just get so many emails. So I, I'm so hyper aware. Oh. So please do, this is no judgment at all. This is just me knowing already what people are going to say on the internet and at you because you've referred to Asperger's. I just want to question if people write to me and say, we don't say Asperger's anymore because Asperger's was a bad man. What do I say to them? Well, first of all, I was referring specifically to a couple of news stories where they do say this person had Asperger's, but I was diagnosed with Asperger's before it was removed from the diagnostic manual. And Uh. there are still people that identify with that definition of autism. Yes, it's been taken away as an official medical diagnosis, but there are a lot of us that go, I don't feel like when I say come out and say I'm autistic, I feel like I'm doing a lot of people who don't have a voice in the autism community disservice because then I'm painting a particular picture of autism that isn't their truth. And so I have to be very clear. Look, I'm talking for me. And for me, Mm. I identify as having Asperger's. I don't identify as being the man who gave his name to the condition. I don't agree with anything he did. I don't agree with anything that he said. And actually, he started out okay. And then he went a little bit QWIFY halfway through if you actually read his full story. Um, And it did get quite dark. And I agree with that completely. But from my point of view, when you hear autism, I don't want you to always think of Rain Man or think, oh, Rialina, she seems quite compassmentous. She seems like she can put her shoes on the right feet. I want you to understand that it's a massive spectrum of people. And there's a lot of people out there who cannot speak for themselves, who cannot you know, who have different different abilities and different things that they bring to the table within their diagnoses of, of autism. And I don't want you to think that because I'm now under that umbrella, that that's what it is. And that's why I still use Asperger's to be able to identify a different uh, manifestation of it than what a lot of other people have. That was such a great answer. And actually, your answer made me sort of emotional because I think the same is true of lots of mental health things. And like, I find it difficult to talk about my OCD when I don't think that's representative of all kinds, often in terms of its interpretation from the listener. And I think it's so valid and so important to say, this is why I talk about it in this way, because it differentiates my experience. But also, I don't want to do a disservice or a misrepresentation to people who are struggling, maybe more. I have just been diagnosed with ADHD, which so many 
women in comedy have. I don't know about the men in comedy. I only hang out with women in comedy. And so if this is just me saying I hardly ever see men in comedy. But so many women have said to me, oh, my God, you should get tested because um, I've changed so much since my diagnosis and I'm on medication and I've had various, you know, therapy for it and my life is so much better and I'm so much more focused. And I think the pandemic's exacerbated it. So I was quite relieved to be diagnosed with it. And I'm really excited to see what will happen if I take the medication and go into a course of treatment. But it does explain a lot that I am not neurotypical. And the things that I've struggled with that I beat myself up over, I realize now, I started following some ADHD accounts and went, oh, I ha- oh, that relate, 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 hard relate, hard relate, hard relate. I'm not sure I relate, hard relate, hard relate. And it turns out I've got a combination of, um, oh, God, Sorry, I've got ADHD, so I can't remember what I've got a combination of. Um, I've got a combination of hyperactive and inattentive. And it was the inattentive one that made me forget. Um, But I think I'm more inattentive than hyperactive because I'm quite sedentary. So I'm just going to say to you, Ria, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? Do you know what we actually covered? I was pleasantly surprised, but that the whole thing about the woman and, you know, the, the phrase violence against women. That's been something that's been bugging me recently. And I, I, I'll admit that was not my idea. I saw it online. I saw someone else talking about it and I went, that is so true. And I felt that that was really important to say, I think that rather than, as you said, the word privilege has been overused and, and it denotes the wrong thing, but I think protection from being looked at, from being critically analyzed is what we're talking about a lot of the times. And I think that's a, certainly a term I'd like to put on the table to say, as opposed to privilege, think about how often your tribe is critically analyzed for the contributions it makes to society. And that's something I think that um, I'm glad I was able to bring that to the table. Mm, Fantastic. Is there anything you would like to plug, Ria, before we go to our music? I'm in this series of Live at the Apollo. So if you have a chance to catch that episode, that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, That was incredible, uh, incredible experience to do. And and that's the sort of the big thing. I just, I've got, just did mock the week. And well, I will have done at the beginning of November. Amazing. Are you, are you doing it? I was going to say, and follow Ria online on oh, yeah, the Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, maybe. Oh yeah, that. Yeah. If you're online, come say hi. I'd love it. I mean, if you want to discuss stuff again, I'm open to that. If you want to just tweet me that I'm wrong, like, use the full 240 and explain as much as you can or like do a little chain tweet because let's talk about it okay because I'm open to hearing your side great Catherine Bohart do you have anything to plug like a brand new podcast yes I do yes please I have a new brand new podcast with Helen Bauer and we are at trusty hogs t-r-u-s-t-y trusty hogs disgusting little piggies that's us um and that's a weekly podcast please listen to it and also i'm going on tour in the new year and you can get uh, by the time this is out you'll be able to find my tour dates on my website at katherinebohart.com wonderful um, what is your so hogs much. podcast about Oh, so we talk about a lot of things, but mainly it's uh, just a, a chat about our week, a chat about our dramas. And and more importantly, we exist so that listeners can send in their problems to us and we will solve them um, like d- little agony ants. But yes, that's it's just it's chaos, though. It is chaos. Fair warning. I wouldn't say it's a, I wouldn't put it at full volume. Wonderful. Is what I'll say. <laughs> Wonderful. So your agony ants who really cause more trouble than you fix. There you go. Oh, my God. We should have put that in the blurb. Darn it. To sing us out, we have a Scottish folk musician whose fourth album, So It Turns, was released in 2019. Uh, please welcome Rachel Samani. Yay! Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Or is it Samani? No, no. What, what did you say before? Samani. Is it Samani or Samani? Samani. So, Samani. so I, as a Scot, would say Samani. And I've heard so many different pronunciations, but then like the actual Italian would be like Samani. You know, like oh, okay. they would... So, Samani. Samani. Okay, so Rachel Samani, uh, are you an Italian <laughs> Scot, Rachel? I'm of those origins, yes. But um, I, I was, um, I've been, my family have been in Scotland for a few generations, at least two. I'm more Irish, to be honest. Oh, you're one yeah. of Catherine's people. 
I'm finally on board with this yes. musical outro. Let's go. Right. There you go. There you go, Catherine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Donegal is like, I think most of my family come from that, that side. This is um, going to be good, guys. Everyone get hyped. So you're an Italian Irish <laughs> person who's been in Scotland for a couple of generations. Um, can you tell us about the songs that you're going to be singing for us today? Yeah, like um, not on theme, to be honest. Like I'm, I'm like I've loved listening to you guys so much and just thinking about like the um, the juxtaposition in some form of uh, of what I'm going to play. And in the set, you know, I, I kind of in in one way I want to like mirror or like sing songs that kind of like relate to all the things that you've said and spoken of. Um, but I think instead I'll sort of um, aim to uh, just uh, bring some songs in that um, I feel like, well, sort of are, are a bit joyful. Can't, actually, they sound joyful, but one of them's probably less less joyful and more more uh, a tribulation. That's the magic of music is that uh, the tribulation can be hidden. In so the first song is um, the first song is called Swallow Me. And um, was written kind of two weeks before giving birth, and I was ready. I was like ready, um, and so it kind of follows my experience of uh, discovering I was pregnant and and onwards up till that moment, um, which was a tribulation in many ways, uh, though also very beautiful. But um, I think it's probably. I feel like it's a safe podcast to be sat in and to say that uh there is tribulation in bearing <laughs> and um yeah so that was my experience oh, I'm sure I'm mm-hmm. sure you're pushing a human being out of your body yes but it must be a nightmare <laughs> can I say as a mother I love this song already <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah, like there's so much. There is so much. And I know that, that it's not my place. I'm not the one to be speaking here, but there's lots. So that's what that song's about. And then the second song is my bliss song. It's like my medicine song, which in a way kind of works in this world also as something to offer. Um, and it's kind of a list of all my favorite things. And I wrote it when I was on a tour one year in Canada. And uh, I wrote it like after having watched the Northern Lights all night and like came in like drunk on sky um, and wrote this like at five in the morning. So they're my two songs. You can see I've been making an effort. You can see I've been working hard, Lord, working hard. And you see I've been putting my trust in You can see I've been laying down, Lord Laying down, soft side up Turning it round, burning it down All to the sound of birdsong It was never a mistake I was always gonna make The right road to take It's over, you're moving out one day It feels right, but you still get scared, son Still get scared I know you're feeling like there's nothing to hold to No arms open wide to enfold you Just go For nothing you can see I've been letting go Lord Letting go And you see I've been thrown in the deep end You can see to the waves I surrender I surrender Swallow me It was never a mistake I was 
was always gonna make the right road to take was there all along So it's over, you stood in the station Come out pale with the reason you're late now You're late And you run for the phone and your mother But there's nowhere to run after that girl song it was never a mistake i was always gonna make the right road to take was there all along wow thanks, wow. thanks. Woo. love it woo, woo, woo. thank you thank you thank you Okay, so that was my, uh... Okay, here comes the medicine song. All good to go. If I have an audience, I, I would say this is a sing-along. <laughs> I know, I, that's like, obviously, that's quite hard to do in, in this circumstance. Maybe Can't not. Zoom. Well, sometimes when the recording comes out, we're all singing at different times because we're a, a second behind. <laughs> so <laughs> we will it. sing along. All right. Yeah, like have some sort of chorus delay effect. Love it. Here we go. verse and 
do like a on the guilty feminist podcast but it's like a venue but that's where we are right now and i tried to make them sing along a little bit louder but that's not gonna happen today here we are and all over the world all over the place and it's nice People who are listening could sing along And this is where I lay my heart Ooh, this is where I lay my heart Is where I lay my heart Is where I lay my heart Ooh, this is where I lay my heart Is where I lay my heart Download and ideally pay for your music or come see you play. <laughs> uh, well, Bandcamp probably um, is mm. is where you could like pay for my music, but you will find it on all the streaming sites as well. If you were just like not feeling re- ready for that, you can go listen to stuff there. And then I also have a tour in late November, a real live tour. Oh. Um, so. If people come to that, that will be really nice. Great. So in late November, you've got a real live tour. And where can we find out if you're coming to a venue near us? I think it's rachelsermani.com. I think you would find all the tour dates there. It would be good to know that for sure, though, because I think your manager would want that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the trick would be just spelling the name because it's I, it's definitely rachelsermani.com, but it's, uh, it's <laughs> S-E-R-M-A-N-N-I. I have never heard more of a folk singer answer than that. The trick would be <laughs> spelling the name right. It's definitely .com. So if you go to rachelsamani.com, it's Rachel spelt the regular way and then Samani spelt S-E-R-M-A-N-N-I and .com and then you'll see how close Rachel Samani is coming to your house and you'll buy tickets to the show that's closest to you. Um, I'm a podcaster so I can do that in this voice. <laughs> hey, Deborah Francis-White. Yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? Oh, I'm so glad you've asked. Do I, actually? Um, it would be really nice if you could rate, review and subscribe the podcast because it helps other people find it. I never really ask for that. I'd, we stopped asking for that really early on, but I'd really like it. If you could rate, review and subscribe uh, this episode or a recent episode that you really enjoyed. And if you would like to get an ad-free version of uh, this podcast, you can join our Patreon there's also various, I do a lot of live uh, events on like Zoom on there as well, where you can come and chat to me, ask me questions. Generally, I get some kind of regular co-host along. We have fun times. It's like a camp, it's a guilty famous campfire. That's what it feels like. So, and there's other little treats and bits and bobs on Patreon. So if you could uh, sign up for that, that would be awesome. Um, it's been such a brilliant thing to have you all on. Thank you so much. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Catherine Bohart, and our very special guest, Ria Lina, and Rachel Samani. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge, produced by Nick Sheldon, the producer was Tom Slipsky from the Spontaneity Shop, thanks to Rachel Craftman, Gina DCR, and everyone who made this episode happen, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Woo! Yeah! Backlit. I've got. Is there anything you can do about that? <laughs> because take... it's bad. I do. I think she looks uh, lovely. Actually, <laughs> actually, 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 no. Um, it's just going to be me going, I don't have herpes. <laughs> Tom, make sure you get that for the screenshot. Oh, goddamn. <laughs>
The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.